Okay, so we can get started now. We'll start with three bows to the Buddha. One. Two. Three. And then we'll do one time the verse of homage, the salutation to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the perfectly enlightened one. Okay, so now we've been reading through the Anguttara Nikaya, that's the numerically organized discourses of the Buddha, and we're still in the Book of Fives. Now we come to Sutta number 57, which is partly similar to an, another Sutta that we did a few weeks ago, the Sutta on the Five Situations, I think it's 47, 48, 49, 50, that group of suttas. It's partly similar, but um, also a little bit different. And maybe this is the more common sutta, which is often taken as a basis for reflection by many Buddhists and traditional Buddhist cultures. So this sutta begins with the Buddha saying that there are five, like translate themes or th things that should often be reflected upon, he says, really by any of his disciples whether it's a woman or a man, whether a householder or, quote, one gone forth, that is a monastic person. So these are five universal themes that we should all from time to time ponder upon. And you could even make this part of your, at least the main themes here, part of your daily recitation, daily re reflection. Okay, so let us go through them. So the first, the woman or man and so forth should often reflect, I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. And you know this is very useful because we're, in a sense, we're always growing older. Not only year by year, not only month by month, not only day by day, but even minute by minute, second by second, we are always in the process of growing older. From the time, <laughs> you could say a little baby comes out from the mother's womb, everybody is standing around, very happy, what a beautiful baby, what a wonderful baby. But the day that baby is born, you could say it's on the way, it's in motion towards old age. It's not that the baby is born one day, and then sometimes it becomes a youth, and then suddenly, just with the snap of a finger, it turns into an old person. But it's a gradual process. And what's an interesting experiment that you can do, it's maybe a little bit of a challenge, you know, every day when you look in the morning after you get up, you go to the bathroom and then you're ready to wash and sort of get ready for the day. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you think every day you think I look the same, no real significant difference. Maybe if we're men, then we look to see whether our whiskers are growing longer so that we need a shave. But otherwise it seems not much difference. But if you take maybe a photograph of yourself from like 30 years ago or even 40 years ago and you ask some of your present friends whether you they can recognize the person in the photo they'll say who is that no i don't know that person but in fact that person is you <laughs> but gradually You've changed every day. You've changed from that time 30 or 40 years ago to the present. 
the change is so such a major change that you're unrecognizable in that photograph you can't pinpoint the difference between the photograph the person in the photograph and yourself but that person in the photograph 30 years ago didn't suddenly jump 30 years in the snap of a finger to the way you are now but that person 30 years ago every day was gradually getting older and older and so the way we are now even if you are in your 20s 30s you still have to reflect that you're subject to old age and you're subject to the infirmities of old age so what are the, the marks or signs of old age the hair turns gray and i know many <laughs> sorry to say this but many women when they see the hair turning gray then they start dyeing the hair to cover up the grayness of the hair because they don't want to be reminded that they're growing old the skin starts to wrinkle and so people will use lotions to smoothen the skin and eliminate the wrinkling the teeth start to decay sometimes they have to be pulled out they break the sense faculties become weaker you might have to start wearing reading glasses or get a hearing aid the sense of taste becomes atrophy so you don't taste the food as clearly as you did as acutely when you were younger and so if you don't reflect on the inevitability of old age then when you really start to encounter the infirmities of old age people become upset and miserable if they think i'm useless i'm worthless i'm old but if you reflect in this way then you can accept that you know, this is what the buddha taught this is the reality the hard fact of life that if we're going to live a full lifespan we're going to have to reach the point of old age so that's the first theme the second theme is that I am subject to illness, not exempt from illness. Again, I remember seeing a diagram some years ago of the human body, and it showed that every part of the body is subject to some kind of illness. With the brain, even if the brain is subject to brain tumors, brain cancer, the head subject to headaches, the eyes subject to various the cataracts, um, glaucoma, problems with vision, ears are subject to earaches, various illnesses of the ears, the respiratory tract, the upper respiratory tract. I remember we have catarrh. It is kind of sinus infection, lung infection, and as we move down, heart, um, heart conditions, heart attacks, angina, stomach ache, upset stomach, ulcers, cancer of the stomach, and so on, all the ways down from head to feet. And so if we don't reflect on the fact of illness, then when we get ill, again, you can become upset and miserable. But if, when, if you do this reflection, then when you get ill, then you can accept the fact of illness with some degree of understanding and equanimity, particularly when it comes to terminal illnesses very grave or serious illnesses, then you recognize that, again, that this is the truth, the hard fact of life. Okay, then the reality that we're always trying to, in a way, to avoid facing, to escape from, is the fact of death. And in fact, in English, we use euphemisms. We don't even like to use the word death, so we don't say, ah, he died yesterday, but he passed away, or he passed on, or he expired. What does expired mean? Literally, breathe it out. 
but it actually means he died. And so we have to do this reflection that I am subject to death, not exempt from death. I don't remember whether the last time I mentioned the three ways of reflecting or the three aspects of doing the meditation on death to reflect that death is absolutely inevitable, inescapable, unavoidable, that we all have to die, that we cannot escape death. And the second is the fact that the arrival of death is completely unforeseeable, unpredictable. We don't know when death is going to strike. I might go out on a fun trip with some of my friends and then some car comes rushing down the perpendicular the road coming from the other direction and crashes into our car and then I'm dead or my friends are dead. So that's the second fact that death is utterly unforeseeable, unpredictable. And then the third aspect of the meditation on death is that when we die, we have to give up everything, leave behind all of our friends, our loved ones, our belongings, leave behind even this physical body. So if you do this reflection, I am subject to death, I'm not exempt from death. Now, this is especially valuable as a protective measure for when death takes place suddenly and unpredictably. Because if, if you've done this meditation, especially emphasizing the unforeseeable, unpredictable nature of death, then when that sudden death takes place, you can realize that this is what I've been rehearsing for. Now it's time to put my previous practicing for death, to put it into actual practice. It's a little bit like doing this reflection. It's like you're in a, in a, in a drama. You're an actor preparing for a drama and you've practiced the rehearsals over and over. And then when finally the play is about to begin and there's an actual audience there, when the curtain comes up and your role comes on, then you can go and you can execute your role perfectly. But if, say, you're assigned a part to the play and you don't really do memorize your lines and you just try to drift through the rehearsals, and then when the curtain opens and you see the audience out there looking excitedly at you, then you blunder and you forget your lines. So this is like rehearsing for the greatest play, the greatest drama that each one of us is going to face, the drama of our own inevitable death. Okay, so this is practicing or reflecting on the inevitability of death. Okay, the fourth theme for reflection <clears throat> is the theme, I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything that is dear and agreeable to me. So maybe the, the aspect of this to put special emphasis on this, I think more or less we are prepared to leave behind the possessions, the material possessions that we cherish. But what's really hard and difficult is to separate from our loved ones, particularly when our loved ones fall ill and or get into an accident and then they die before us. <clears throat> And so it's that final parting and separation that can cause such deep grief that just cuts into the heart, cuts into the, even to the entrails of the body and becomes so difficult to overcome. And so one keeps on calling to mind, one's 
uh, enjoyable memories of one's contact with one's, could be one's spouse, maybe one's parents, one's friends, one's cousins, and especially painful for parents who will lose young children, children, their children who die before them. And so if you have, if you're not prepared for that in advance, it becomes something that you can't really believe, can't face and accept. You even try to maybe try to deny the reality of the death of a loved one. And what seems so frustrating that you, the memory of your contact with the loved one is so clear and so vivid. And you think if only they had been ill and had recovered from that illness, we would still be together. But now it's like they've passed through a door and they're on the other side of a wall and that door has been removed. The wall, pl the place where the door was is plastered over and there's no way to get across that wall. You look up, maybe I could climb over the wall, but the wall just extends all the ways up to outer space. And the loved one is on the other side of the wall, you're on this side, and no way to resume contact with them. Of course, then people will, some people will go to the medium the, the, um, and participate in a seance in the hope of making contact with the loved one through the medium. But um, I don't know whether there's any reality to that. Okay, now, if you practice this, this is, my opinion, which is not fully in accord with the orthodox monastic position, which is when you lose a loved one, you should not feel any sorrow or grief at all. But what I say is that when you lose a loved one, someone that you've been with, especially a husband or a wife, you've been with them for 20, 30, 40 years, or a child who's passed away too early, it's quite natural and normal to feel grief. And what I would say is that the experiencing the grief is part of the natural healing process. And so one should let oneself feel that grief, experience it, experience it fully, but do so first with mindfulness. When you experience grief, you know I am experiencing grief. And then you bring, on top of the mindfulness, you bring sampajanya or panya, clear comprehension or wisdom, knowing that impermanence is written into the very substance of life, that there had to be parting and separation at some point and that the extent of life is utterly unpredictable. So your spouse can pass away even years before you pass away, or your children could pass away in childhood or young adult life. And so when you bring this understanding to bear, to bear then you can let yourself experience the grief, experience the sorrow, and you work through it until you emerge triumphant over it through using mindfulness and clear comprehension. And that doesn't mean that you won't experience periods of grief in the future. That, that could happen. But when it happens again, you let yourself experience the grief, but do it with mindfulness and sampajanya, clear understanding. And that helps to turn that grief into, let's say, a way of strengthening wisdom, of cultivating wisdom and strengthening wisdom. Because now you come to a sort of deep personal understanding of the very nature of life. So you're no longer living in that illusion of permanence the illusion of inseparability. And then you can do further reflection. It's not in the sutta, but 
We see this in some of the stories, particularly the Dhammapada commentary. The Buddha says that you can reflect that in this beginningless samsara, we ha actually there are suttas like this in the Sangyutta Nikaya, that it's difficult to find that in this beginningless samsara, we've been parted from our mothers and fathers, parted from our husbands and wives, parted from our sons and daughters countless times, incalculable times. And every time we've been parted from our loved ones, we've wept streams of tears. And if you collect all of those tears, collect them together, they will constitute a mass greater than the water of the ocean. And so if you reflect that so often in this beginningless samsara, I've been separated from my loved ones, from husband, from wife, from children, from parents, then you see that this present parting and separation is just one more, um, one more separation in this countless stream of separations that we've undergone through beginningless time. Okay, so that is the fourth theme for reflection. And the fifth theme of reflection, this is very important one, and we'll come to the reasons for this, that this is the reflection on the law of karma. It says that I am the, o the owner of my karma, the heir of my karma, I have karma as my origin, as my relative, as my resort, that I will be the heir of whatever karma, good or bad, that I do. And so what is karma? Karma, there's a lot of mystique around this word karma, but the Buddha defines karma very succinctly as volitional action. That is action that springs from volition, from intention, from motivation, um, action which might be performed bodily with the body of its means of expression, verbally through speech, or karma that is generated only by thoughts, by inner emotions. And so karma is volitional action and the volitional action, as the text here says, can be good or bad. Here the sutta uses kalyana va, kalyana va, papagang va, good or bad. But the more technical terms are wholesome and unwholesome. So our volitional actions might be good and wholesome, bad and unwholesome. And the important fact about volitional action according to the Buddha's teaching, is that when once actions are performed, they don't vanish without a trace, but they leave imprints, subtle impressions on the stream of mind. Imprints or impressions with the potential to produce results in the future. And so the primary way that the karma produces its result is by governing the rebirth process. So when we die, the stream of consciousness moves on to rebirth in some new existence, even some other realm. And what determines where the stream of consciousness will take rebirth, the conditions under which it will take rebirth, even the realm of existence in which the stream of consciousness will arise again is our karma, our good and bad actions. And so in that way, karma is said to be our yoni, our origin. And the karma is our relative, like just as our relatives, we form like a circle with our relatives, Maybe you visit your cousins or the cousins come to visit you. And so the karma trails along with you. 
it accompanies you. And then in the course of life, it will produce its results. Sometimes the unwholesome karma will bring some unfortunate or undesirable results. The good karma will, presume, will produce fortunate or desirable results in the course of life. And so karma is our resort. If we want to change our destiny, maybe we can change it completely in this life, but to change the direction of our movement through samsara from life to life, the way to change our destiny is by changing the kind of action that we engage in. So if we have disposition towards unwholesome action, then we have to abandon, refrain from and abandon those unwholesome actions and co commit ourselves to performing good and wholesome actions. And in that way, by changing our karma, we change our character and then we change our future destiny. Okay, so those are the five main themes for reflection. And now the sutta, the, the sutta is going to expand on these themes and explain the benefit of these reflections. So for the sake of what benefit? And then we're going to see that there are two levels of benefits that the text will mention. One is what we might call the mundane benefit, and the other is the world transcending or liberative benefit. Okay, so now we come first to the mundane benefit. Okay, so he says, for what is the benefit of often reflecting that I am subject to old age and so on? I'm not exempt from old age. Okay, so the text tells us, in their youth, people are intoxicated with their youth. And when they're intoxicated with their youth, they engage in misconduct, or let us say, foolish conduct by way of body, speech, and mind. Okay, so let's just consider, like, I don't know if you have memories of your days as a college student, to be a freshman in college, particularly if you've grown up with your parents and then you go to college uh, where you're living away from your from your home and you're living in a dormitory with a group of other young people your age, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, you could see that they engage in a lot of maybe not extremely harmful, but a lot of foolish action. And so they go out, you know, drinking, getting intoxicated, literally intoxicated. And then once they get intoxicated, they might do reckless things. And sometimes it could become quite serious. Like there are a lot of reports and about college students, especially the male students raping female students and the female students who get literally intoxicated allow themselves to be sexually abused by their m m male pe the fellow students. Um, sometimes they'll go engage in automobile races and get involved in automobile accidents. So you could do many foolish things because you're, you're young, you don't have the wisdom and you don't have the kind of the quality of sagacity that comes with age. Okay, but even as a young person, when, if you reflect on the inevitability of old age, then that intoxication with youth is abandoned or diminished. Yeah, and even if the young person doesn't engage in these gross unwholesome actions, still they become sort of swollen with a kind of pride, thinking that they're always going to be young and they can look down at older people and speak abusively towards older people, disparage older people, even hit them physically, thinking I'm young and strong, get out of my way. 
grandpa. Okay, so the benefit of reflecting on old, old age is that you get rid of this intoxication with youth. Okay, then the benefit of reflecting on the inevitability, the inescapable nature of illness. Okay, when people are healthy, then they become intoxicated with their health. And in a state of health, they engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. But when you often reflect upon this theme, then intoxication with health is either abandoned or diminished, even if you don't get rid of it completely, it's diminished. <clears throat> okay, then the benefit of reflecting upon the inevitability of death. Okay, when pe people are alive, that then they're intoxicated with life, and then full of this intoxication with life, then they engage in misconduct by body, speech, or mind. But when one often reflects upon the inevitability of death, actually this theme should also connect with the reflection on karma, because you realize that this life is going to come to an end. And when this life comes to an end, then I will have to reap the results of my karma. And so then you lose this intoxication with life, the intoxication that enables one to engage in bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. And so when you reflect that I have to, at some point I will die, and when I die, I pass on to a new existence in which I reap the results of my karma, then you turn away from misconduct and you make the strong commitment, even a vow to engage in good bodily, verbal, and mental action. You give up any kind of you know, reckless behavior, and especially you see the need to train the mind, not simply just by reflecting in this way, but to train the mind in some kind of meditation practice because it's when death comes, even if it comes at the end of a full lifespan, but particularly if it comes suddenly and unexpectedly, the mind can go into a kind of panic mode. You lose complete control, and there's something you never expected and never thought would happen, and now it's occurring. But if you've done some kind of meditative practice, you have this reflection on death, and you've done some kind of meditative practice to the, the previous reflection on death, then you know now the curtain is open, the audience is out there staring up at me, I have to perform successfully. And so now you have to face death with a firm, steady mind. And it's the prior practice of meditation that enables you to develop some degree of sati, samadhi, and sampajanya, that is some mindfulness, so that when the life processes are closing down, you can observe the shutdown with mindfulness. And it's the samadhi, the degree of samadhi, that enables you to turn the mind and focus the mind on a primary object so that your mind remains steady, calm, focused, balanced in the face of death. And it's the sampajanya or panya, the understanding or wisdom that enables you to relinquish, to give up, to leave behind this body and all your loved ones and to pass on peacefully.
Okay, so this is the benefit of reflecting on death in conjunction with the reflection on karma. And what happens at death, this is according to maybe the commentarial teaching, but also there seems to be some support of this from actual you know, cases of people who have had near death experiences and then have come back to life. According to the Buddha's teaching, that when one is about entering into the death process, what often happens is that some karma that one has performed repeatedly in the course of one's life appears in front of you, in front of the mind, or the destination, some sign or image or symbol of the destination of rebirth appears in front of you. And so if you've developed a strong mind through meditation and say some unwholesome karma has come to the surface and is now pushing the mind towards an undesirable rebirth, through the force of your meditation, the power of your meditation, you could push that away and bring to mind some wholesome object, some favorable object. For example, if you've done, let us say you've practiced regularly mindfulness of breathing, and then some, because you've done some bad karma in the past, so maybe the sign of a rebirth, let's say in the realm of the hungry ghosts is starting to appear in front of you. Okay, now you recognize that this is the sign of a bad rebirth, and this is all happening very quickly. And now you focus the mind on the breath, just being mindful, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, and you steady the mind on that. And in this way, you're generating a positive, wholesome state of mind so that the movement of the mind towards the realm of the hungry ghosts gets pushed to the side and through the power of the mindfulness of breathing you can move to a rebirth back into the human realm or maybe even into one of the heavenly realms and maybe in my view maybe what's most conducive to a good rebirth would be the buddha nusati recollection of the buddha particularly if you use a visual image of the Buddha, like a statue or a, a, a painting of the Buddha. Because as the death process is coming on, if some undesirable object manifests, then again, you can replace that undesirable object you bring to mind through the power of meditative development. You bring to mind the image of the Buddha and maybe some designation. Bhagava Arahang Sama Sambuddho, or Buddho Bhagava, Buddho Bhagava. And then you're relying on the power, the spiritual power of the Buddha to push the tendency towards the undesirable rebirth, to eclipse it and push it away and move towards a desirable rebirth. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the benefit of reflecting often on death. Whoops. Okay, the benefit of reflecting on the parting and separation from one's loved ones. Yeah, here I would actually modify the text. First, let's read the text that we have here. People have desire. The Pali is Chandaraga, but Maybe lust is not so suitable a word. I would say they it's more like attachment. So people have attachment in regard to their loved ones. And then driven by that attachment, here it says they engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. But what I would say, the way I would modify it, that when because of their attachment, when they're loved when they're parted from their loved ones, particularly parted by death then they get overcome by sorrow and grief and crushed and you know, completely oppressed 
and crushed by their sorrow and grief to the point that they have no desire to go on living. They lose their appetite and life seems meaningless and pointless to them. But if one has done this reflection regularly, as I explained earlier, then you can allow yourself to experience the grief, experience the sorrow, but by returning to this theme that there must be parting and separation from everyone you love, then you can emerge from the grief, recover your zest for living, and again find meaningful, purposeful activities to sustain you in your life. So that's a benefit of reflecting on parting and separation. Okay, then we have the theme of reflecting that I am the owner of my karma, the heir of one's karma. Okay, so people don't have clear understanding of karma, particularly people with no religious belief at all, or even many people with religious belief, but still that they don't even, I have to say, even people in the Buddhist world who don't, even though they're exposed to the teaching of karma, but they don't reflect regularly on the reality, the law of karma. And so it just remains like a dull theme sounding in the background. It's a little bit like, you know, you're living in a house by the side of a busy road and the traffic is going by all the time. Cars are whizzing by, but because you get used to it. And so you don't even hear the traffic. So you, if you're a Buddhist, you go to sermons and the monk is speaking about karma, 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 and it just comes and goes in one ear and out the other. But if you take this as a theme for reflection, then you realize the rea that karma is something, a principle that should govern your life. And so this will serve as a strong basis, an intellectual foundation for avoiding misconduct by body, speech, and mind, and engaging in good conduct through body, speech, and mind, so that you avoid accumulating unwholesome karma, so that the misconduct is abandoned or diminished, and you accumulate a reserve of, we call this punya, or punya karma, wholesome or meritorious karma that will sustain you as you move from this life to the future life. So that's the mundane benefit of reflecting on this law of karma. Okay, but now the sutta takes us further to, this is the proper practice for the noble disciple. You see, the, this section of the sutta just speaks about a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth. But now the next section speaks about the reflection of the noble disciple. And this doesn't necessarily mean a disciple who is a noble one. The way I've seen the word noble disciple used in the sutta, whoops. Sound disappeared. The sound disappeared? Yes. Do you, you don't hear me? We can, well, I can hear. Okay. We can hear you, Bhante. Yeah, I we was typing. I was typing. Yeah. That's why the sound disappeared. Okay. So the word here is Arya Savaka, and some have interpreted this, interpreted this to mean a disciple who is an Aryan person, that is somebody from stream entry on up. But I don't think that's the case. <clears throat> The way I see it, the word Aryan disciple is used in the sutta to indicate a disciple of the Buddha who is committed to the 
who has a good understanding of the Dhamma and is engaged in the practice of the Dhamma, not necessarily one who has reached a minimum stage of stream entry. So this is the way the disciple engaged in the practice reflects. And this expands the range of the reflection. I am not the only one who is subject to old age, and so on. All the beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, all beings everywhere are subject to old age. None are exempt from old age. And then before we go further, and this is applied to each of the other themes, and I'll, I'll come back to this portion of the sutta. Okay, then one reflects, I am not the only one who's subject to illness, but all beings everywhere in every state of existence are subject to illness. I'm not the only one who is subject to death. All beings that come and go, that pass away, are subject to death. None are exempt from death. And I found this one to be an extremely powerful reflection. Yeah, I've used this myself as a way of sort of, you start off, you do the meditation on death with application to yourself, reflecting that I am subject to death, I have not escaped death. But then when you get some degree of familiarity with that, you sort of cast your mental vision out upon the world, you know, extending, let's say I'm in New York State, so I move the mind out from New York State all over the United States, then to every continent in this world, and then to every realm of existence, and reflect that every being in every realm is moving ever closer each day, each hour, each moment. We're all moving ever closer to death. And it really arouses a strong sense of sangvega, a kind of inner agitation, but not a disturbing agitation, but a sense of urgency and also a kind of, almost like a profound insight that every second, every moment, we're moving ever closer to death. And when you reflect in that way, you see that all of the fighting that we're engaged in, all of these selfish pursuits seem so meaningless. <clears throat> I recall, years ago, I think this was 2006, I was in Taiwan, and I was in a car, and I think it was going, I think we had gone to Kaohsiung in the south, and we were going back up to Jai, and the car had stopped at a light, and in the next lane, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but there was a kind of vehicle, like a truck, and in the back part of the truck, it had like wooden boards. That between the boards was open, and it was filled with pigs. And I looked across, and I could see that the pigs were fighting and struggling with against each other for the grains, grains of food that had been provided for them. And I knew that that truck was moving to this, was going to the slaughterhouse, but the pigs were fighting. I'm going to get that, that pile of grain. No, get out of the way, I'm, it's mine, I'm going to get it. This one is fighting against that one. The strongest pig comes in and says, you all get out of the way, it's mine. But they're all heading to the same place and probably within the hour they'll be lined up and ready for the slaughter. And so when you reflect in this way, you get the sense that all of these worldly pursuits just pointless, because all of us are moving closer to death.
Okay, you could okay, we could apply the same to each of the others, but let's come back to that additional passage. Now the text continues and it says, as the disciple often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. It says, Mugo, I think it's Sanjayati. And this is referring here to the super mundane path or the world transcending path, the Lokutara Mugga. <clears throat> so it seems to be saying that just by reflecting how all beings everywhere in every realm are subject to old age, to illness and death, that is sufficient for the path, the world transcending path to arise. Though I have to say, I'm a little uncertain whether this should be taken perfectly literally. The way I would understand this is that reflecting on the universality of old age, illness, death, and so on, generates that sangvega, the sense of urgency. And then it's this, through the sense of urgency that one takes up with greater commitment, greater um, conviction, greater enthusiasm, the mundane path of serenity and insight, calm and insight, concentration and wisdom. And then it's through developing more strongly calm and insight that is right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, and panya, wisdom. It's through developing those factors that the path, the world transcending path, is generated. And then once that path arises, then the text says, one pursues the path, develops it, and cultivates it. And as he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. And so what are the fetters? I should have made a chart, but I didn't. There are the 10 fetters. So with the stage of stream entry, we abandon the three lowest fetters, the fetter of the view of self, the fetter of doubt, and the attachment to rules and rituals or rules and superstitious observances. Then reaching the second stage, the path of the once returner, one doesn't abandon any fetters completely, but one weakens greed, hatred, and delusion. By reaching the third stage, one abandons the fetters that tie one to the desire realm of existence, the fetter of sensual craving and the fetter of ill will or anger. And then one develops, cultivates the path further to the stage of arhatship. And at the path of arhatship, one abandons the five subtle fetters. That is the craving for rebirth in the form realm, craving for rebirth in the formless realm, the restlessness, the conceit of I am, and the subtle layer of ignorance, the subtlest stratum of ignorance. And so with that, all the 10 fetters are abandoned. And then we have usually seven underlying tendencies. And I should have, yeah, we have the seven underlying tendencies. Let's see if I could just remember them offhand. Okay, one is the underlying tendency towards, okay, let me cheat and go to, <laughs> to Anguta the Nikaya, Book of Sevens, number 11. Just 
just before the class when I was reviewing, I just assumed that I knew them offhand. Okay, the seven are the underlying tendencies to sensual lust, to aversion, to views, to doubt, to conceit, to craving for existence, and to ignorance. So as one develops the path at the stage of stream entry, one will eradicate the underlying tendency to views and to doubt. When one reaches the third stage, the stage of non-returner, one el eradicates the underlying tendency to sensual lust and the underlying tendency to aversion or ill will. So now we've eliminated four underlying tendencies. And then with the attainment of the path of arhatship, one eradicates the remaining three underlying tendencies, the tendency to conceit, the tendency to craving for existence, and the underlying tendency to ignorance. Okay, and so from this, one could see the benefit, the world transcending benefit of cultivating these five themes of reflection that at the mundane level, they serve as incentive for avoiding unwholesome conduct and engaging in wholesome conduct. And at the higher level, as undertaken by a dedicated practitioner, they can lead to the world transcending path through which one abandons the fetters and eradicates the underlying tendencies. Okay, and so with this, we can end my formal discourse and look to see if we have any questions. And the way that you ask the questions is you look for the raised hand symbol and you click that. Okay, I see Mariam in California. Yes, good morning, Bhante. Thank you. I have a question about the karma you were talking at the very beginning, that you said we create karmas through our thinking, through our speech, and through our action, basically. And I wanted to know if they have the same weight basically so if i have some anger or if i have some unwholesome thoughts would it create the same karma as if i actually take action about it or talk about it or if it's just in my mind is a little bit less unwholesome karma that i'm getting. yeah yeah that's a very important question <clears throat> And I would think that the karma is weaker if it remains solely in the form of thoughts as contrasted with whether it, see, it obtains expression through bodily action and through or through speech. Because often the impulse towards some kind of unwholesome action arise it always arises first in the mind and so often it's inevitable that unwholesome inclinations plans desires will arise in the mind so what we do in training and then once the, those unwholesome thoughts or inclinations or intentions arise in the mind they sort of push 
for expression through bodily action or through speech. And so what we do as part of the training, we make the determination not to give way to the unwholesome action that it's motivating or the, not to express the maybe the abusive speech or the harsh speech or the false speech that the thoughts are driving us towards. And in this way, the unwholesome action still remains in the form of thoughts, but because we're not giving it expression, it's we're sort of debilitating it, weakening it to the point that as we go on cultivating in this way, the tendency has less opportunity to find expression. And that way it gets weaker and weaker till it falls away. Maybe to give like an analogy, it's like somebody who has been maybe a habitual cigarette smoker. And then they make the determination, I'm going to stop smoking. And so they make this determination and then maybe they see other people smoking and the desire arises in the mind, let me smoke just one time, taking one more cigarette won't hurt. Okay, so if they yield to that impulse and light up the cigarette, so they made the determination, I'll just smoke one more cigarette, but that inclination to smoke again is going to arise again and again and again. And before long, they've given up the determination to give up smoking and they become a full-fledged smoker again. <laughs> but if you've made that determination to give up smoking and you don't yield to the impulse to smoke, even though the desire becomes so strong, so oppressive, but still you resist it, as you do so over time, the desire to smoke loses its grip on the mind and then you become free from the habit of smoking. Okay, let's move on. Okay, we can take- Thank you. BC, Deborah. Yes, thank you, Bonte. Um, uh, 60 years ago, when I was um, in Catholic school, I, um, they taught that uh, the confession you should do before death has to be sincere. You, you, you can't, confess, recognize your sins because of a fear of hell. Yeah. Um, kind of otherwise it doesn't work. And 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 I see and it, it it's always struck me in these discussions of karma that the Buddha emphasizes the mechanism of karma, which I appreciate and love. So am I right in in um, seeing this, these reflections on karma as a way to pierce ignorance rather than, um, I do hear, you know, hear people say, I'm afraid of the karma. It's not fear that motivates us. It's understanding how it works. It's not fear of a bad rebirth, but rather if we understand how we are creating our karma, then we have a, a, a one chink in our chain of ignorance that is being weakened. Am, am I right in understanding it that way, that there isn't fear involved in this, but rather um, power? The, the yeah, there is a power of understanding, but also I think that there should be some, in fact, there are some suttas who say this, that there should be some kind of fear serving as a motivation for not engaging in unwholesome conduct of body, speech, and mind. There's a technical term for that in Buddhism. It's called otappa. And, and how would that... Um... How would that parallel then intention? Um, that's not part of our intention that we're afraid. It's you just know, that the, the fear of the two, there are two qualities that keep one, that sort of prevent one from engaging in unwholesome action. One is called, the Pali word is hiri, Again, we don't have a good tr English translation for this. So I've translated it as the sense of moral shame. Yeah. But it's the thing that makes one sort of a, to preserve one's sense of inner dignity and self-respect, one avoids unwholesome action. And though Tupper is the factor that 
from fear of the consequences, including the karmic consequences, one refrains from unwholesome action. So it is, <clears throat> it is fear, not It's not a kind of fear that grips the mind. Oh, I'm afraid, I'm frightened. It's not that kind of fear. But you have some understanding of the way karma works. And so you don't want to have to undergo those disagreeable, even painful experiences of the ripening of bad karma. And yeah. so through to avoid that from otapa, one refrains from the unwholesome karma. And I can see in the moral shame, the holding on to the dignity, that there's a recognition yeah, yeah. of the, the the foulness of the action or thought yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. speech. And and so it's not just fear. It's, a, yeah, it's a yeah. recognition. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. We'll move on with the question. So, Lee? Lee? You unmute. That's it. Okay. Now you're. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Bonte. Uh, yeah. I also wrote this in the chat. Is that uh, I always have been focusing on that we're supposed to uh, eliminate conceptual proliferation, and it see it it seems to me that by uh, contemplating these reflections, it it would make imprints in the mind that would basically encourage uh, conceptual proliferation. And I, yeah. see, uh, I see sort of a, a conflict there. And, yeah. and I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, I think that's because the word conceptual proliferation is used as a translation of a poly expression or a poly term. The poly term is papancha. And so papancha is, you might call this, And maybe put the emphasis on proliferation. So it's forming conceptual ideas which get out of hand, which are unrealistic, which are arbitrary and sort of spring from a kind of mental agitation. But this is focused reflection. It's using conceptual ideation as a way of, of training the mind in order to accomplish certain desirable aims. One is to serve as the motivation for avoiding unwholesome action and engaging in wholesome action. And the for the noble disciple is for reaching the liberative path. So it's a wholesome kind of reflection. It's not, it doesn't come under the heading of papancha. Papancha is a kind of uncontrolled, unregulated, wild, reckless mental activity. Okay, we'll move on to Ron. Ron. Yes, yes, thank you. You you, you were <clears throat> talking earlier about the uh, ways of uh, uh, upon the moment of death uh, when one can feel uh, that that uh, rebirth is going in the undesirable direction. Yeah. Certain things somebody can do to kind of uh, change that uh, in, in, in a, to a better rebirth. Yeah. So, so is w karma that previous karma from 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 previous rebirths? Okay, that yeah. one can, one can see uh, are coming to fruition in one's present life. Yeah, and uh, one can assume that they will still continue to come up throughout that person's life, is there any way to cancel karma that was already uh, uh, came to uh, be from a previous life? Is there any way to cancel it in, the, in, in one's life or to yeah. am ameliorate it? Or, or is I, it? Yeah, I'd say to ameliorate it, perhaps not completely cancel it, but and when can't know this for sure. I mean, it's not like a one-to-one -one, uh, method where you can just, you know, aim, sort of aim your mind at a particular past karma and thinking I'm going to cancel or ameliorate that karma. But if you do a lot of wholesome karma, 
that provides a kind of cushion or a shield so that if some bad karma from the past has a tendency, an inevitable tendency to ripen in this life, when it ripens, the impact will be weaker than if one continues to engage in unwholesome actions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so but it's not inevitable. Sometimes there are certain, a person might be very good, very pure, very wonderful in their activities, but there's just some very strong unwholesome act karma from the past, which has to produce its result in this life. That can't be avoided. That can be avoided. So besides, in addition to, 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 I mean, good karma in the present life, I assume that would include studying Dharma, I mean, uh, praying, uh, uh, compassionate acts, whatever, exactly, refraining, yeah. refraining yeah. from bad stuff. Okay, all that. Okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. But some things are so powerful from previous life that are unavoidable. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we take Xiao Ping. Thank you so much, Bandy. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for the wonderful teaching. I love this kind of five reflections, but I found the it kind of contradictory for myself when I do meta meditation. Say, uh, may I be well? May I be happy? May I be? I think no, no, no. You, you supposed to be that. I'm something like a, not generated like sincere happiness. When I reflect the, the, this five reflection. Wait, say again, I didn't quite catch. Okay, you're doing meta meditation? No, I reflect this five, five thing, like I'm about to die. I'm, yeah. I will seek, I will, you know, my karma is my owner yeah. and whatever I get, I should take. But then when I do mental meditation, this kind of thing, like for example, my be well, and then my, end of my mind, you, you're supposed to be there anyway. Something like this. And then that make mental meditation not gen- generate like the happiness Something like that. Then I just do matter for you. I mean, be a booty, be well, and then I feel happy. Yeah. So, is that, do you feel that kind of contradictory when you practice matter meditation with the reflection of this five reality? I'm not quite sure that I caught the question. Maybe if you write it to me and then I'll answer it by email. Okay, thank you. Okay, because I'm going to have to end now. I'm sorry, I see there are a few more questions. Does anybody have a short question? Simple question. Cat? K A T. Um, hi, hi, Bandy. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you mm. for the lecture. Um, so my question is really quick related to just an example of what is um, um, so like at my workplace, I volunteer to help out a new hire coming in. And so I guess in that sense, I generate a good karma. Yeah. But, you know, like, you know, like it's going through work and then as I come home, I generally speaking to my spouse and bringing up a topic or something happened at work. And it happened to be like, oh, you know, this new hire did this or did that. So when I bring up as a topic of discussion of that new hire, am I generating bad karma of talking about that person? No, I don't think so. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to end the session now because I have to go for the meal. (laughs) Okay, so... um, Thank you all for joining. Now, next week, we won't be having a class because I have, through my other organization, Buddhist Global Relief, we're having a special like short New Year retreat on Friday evening. Friday evening will be like blessing ceremonies and Saturday will be all day retreat. If you want to participate in that, 
you go to the website of Buddhist Global Relief, and I think it's on the front, the home page of the website, and then you can register for that retreat. It's not like an intensive meditation retreat, but it's to provide sort of words of encouragement, advice, and some meditation to welcome in the new year. And then we'll have the next class will then be on the Saturday after that, that's January 14th. And they'll have like maybe one or two more sutta classes, then we'll go through the winter months, we'll do the longer meditation sessions. Okay, so let us end with sharing the merits, all the merits that we've gotten through the course of this year, 2022. We could share the oh, merits good. with the devas, the buddhas, and all other beings. So I'll recite the verses. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahiti ka punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahiti ka punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu desanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mehidika punyantang anomoditva chirangra kantu mang parang duka pata chani duka baya pata chani baya soka pata chani soka antu sabepi panino may those in suffering be free from suffering May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all beings also be thus, and may all beings, including especially you, all have a happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bhante. Happy, happy, happy new year. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you for sharing the Dhamma okay. over all okay. these years. <laughs> Okay. 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 Okay.